Hello, everyone. My name is Lionel Arteaga. I am a scientist at NASA Goddard through the cooperative agreement with USRA. And today I want to show you some work that I did during, mostly during my time at Princeton University, aiming at understanding phytoplankton bloom dynamics and marine primary production using the bio-optical information coming from the BGC arc floats. The, my co-authors in these studies were Professor Emmanuel Boss from the University of Maine, Professors Michael J. Berenfeld and Toby Westbury, Westbury from Oregon State University, and Professor Jorge Sarmiento from Princeton University. And this talk is part of the virtual GoVGC science workshop that is taking place between the 28th and 30th of June of 2021. So my idea for today is to summarize two studies that share the common idea of trying to estimate phytoplankton division rates using the bio-optical information that we get from the floats. The first study that I want to talk about is a Bloom study that is motivated by the analysis that Mike Bernfeld has been doing using satellite information, in particular a space-based LiDAR. Here on the left, I'm showing you phytoplankton bloom dynamics for the south polar sun. In the bottom panel in blue, we have the phytoplankton division rate, which is driven by the availability of nutrients and light. In the upper panel, for now, let's just focus on the black line, which is the net biomass accumulation rate. So whenever this black line is positive, that means that we have net biomass accumulation in the surface ocean. And whenever it is negative, we have net biomass decline. And the main takeaway from this study is that there seems to be a seasonal decoupling between the phytoplankton division rate in the blue line and the net biomass accumulation rate in the black line, where the peak in phytoplankton division rates happens about three months later than the actual peak in the biomass accumulation rate. It is particularly interesting that during the peak in the phytoplankton division rate, which is supposed to be the time of the year where we have the most optimal combination of nutrients and light conditions, that's when we see a shift in the phase of the biomass accumulation rate. And phytoplankton biomass stops accumulating in the surface ocean and it starts declining. And at the beginning, this is somewhat of a puzzling result. And the way that it is currently understood is that we need to invoke top-down processes, in particular loss processes, in order to understand the seasonal dynamics of the bloom meaning that it's not enough to just understand changes in phytoplankton division rates. It is not enough to just understand changes, temporal changes in bottom-up processes, such as the availability of nutrients and light to understand things such as bloom initiation and bloom termination. And probably also to understand or project future changes in phytoplankton bloom dynamics. The second study that I want to talk about is more directly focused at the estimation and validation of vertically resolved primary production estimates using the floats. And here I just wanted to take the opportunity of using the vertically resolved phytoplankton biomass information that we get from the floats and that is normally difficult to get from satellites. So the idea is that by having this vertically resolved primary production estimates and combining that information with the satellite information, we might be able to start having a three-dimensional view of primary production in the global ocean. The model that I use in both of these studies is the carbon-based productivity model or CBPM. And the main idea behind it is that one can use changes in the phytoplankton chlorophyll to carbon ratio to parameterize phytoplankton division rates. And this comes very handy to us because both phytoplankton chlorophyll and carbon are two variables that we can relatively easily infer from the optical information coming from the floats. In terms or with respect to light, the phytoplankton chlorophyll to carbon ratio follows a decreasing exponential function where as we go into lower light levels, phytoplankton increases its cellular quota of chlorophyll to cope with the lack of light. And we see this behavior both in laboratory experiments and in satellite-based satellite -based estimates of the chlorophyll to carbon ratio. In the bottom panel, I'm showing you the relationship between the chlorophyll to carbon ratio and light for different ocean regions with different nutrient concentrations. 
the uppermost blue line represents the theoretical maximum chlorophyll to carbon ratio that is achieved under optimal nutrient replete conditions. So in very general terms, the way in which the model works is that it follows this um, decreasing exponential relationship to tell you something about the effects of light on the chlorophyll to carbon ratio. And then it assesses the vertical difference between the blue line and any of the black lines to tell you about the nutrient effect on the chlorophyll to carbon ratio. On the right, I'm showing you the basic equations of the CBPM, where the phytoplankton division rate or phytoplankton growth is parameterized as a function of a maximum phytoplankton division rate, a light limiting term, and a nutrient limiting term. The light limiting term is parameterized following a standard relationship with light. Perhaps more importantly here is to understand the nutrient limitation term, which is driven by the difference, the relative difference between the locally observed chlorophyll to carbon ratio of phytoplankton and the theoretical maximum chlorophyll to carbon ratio under nutrient replete conditions. So in a way, assessing the relative difference between the locally observed chlorophyll to carbon and the theoretical maximum is analogous to assessing the vertical difference between the blue line and any of the black lines, which represent a local observed chlorophyll to carbon ratio at a particular region of the ocean. That is again uh, a simplification of how the model works. And if you want to understand more about it, these are the two papers that you should read. The one on the left deals with the development of the model and the idea of using changes in the chlorophyll to carbon ratio of phytoplankton to parameterize phytoplankton division rates. The one on the right was already trying to estimate the surface structure in phytoplankton biomass and in primary production and division rates using surface satellite information. So in a way, what I've done here is I have simplified this model because I no longer need to worry about the vertical structure of phytoplankton biomass because I can get that information from the optical instruments in the floats. So all I need to worry about is that the parameterization of the phytoplankton division rate and the estimates of primary production are accurate enough and apply that to the flow data. There are different ways in which one can estimate phytoplankton carbon biomass using the float information. If we are in the Southern Ocean, there are local relationships that we can make use of. The floats measure the backscattering coefficient at 700 nanometers. So we can use local relationships for the Southern Ocean between particulate organic carbon or POC and BBP at 700 nanometers to estimate POC. And then again, local relationships to estimate phytoplankton carbon from POC. If we're interested in more global relationships or studies, we can convert the information coming from the floats from the backscattering coefficient at 700 to the backscattering coefficient at 470 nanometers. And then again, use globally constrained relationships between phytoplankton biomass and BBP 470 to estimate phytoplankton carbon biomass. The first study that I want to focus on is on the seasonal modulation of phytoplankton biomass in the Southern Ocean. Here we estimate the net biomass rate of change or the accumulation rate using the biomass estimates from the bio optical instruments on the floats. The phytoplankton division rate is modeled using the CBPM the biomass information coming from the floats and surface irradiance information coming from satellites. And that is the one point where we're still dependent on satellite information because the second flows that I have analyzed, they do not have irradiance sensors. And then we can also estimate the loss rate as the difference between the accumulation rate and the phytoplankton division rate. And this is the main scientific takeaway of that study. What I'm showing you here is seasonal temporal dynamics of phytoplankton blooms. On the left y-axis, we have the phytoplankton division rate on red. The right y-axis gives you the scale for the net rate of change of biomass or the accumulation rate, which is the blue line. 
So remember, whenever the blue line is positive, we have net biomass accumulation. And whenever it is negative, we have net biomass decline. I'm also making things a little bit easier here. And whenever we have biomass accumulation, I'm highlighting that in gray, and I'm calling that the blooming phase. And the main takeaway here is that we see the same temporal lag between the peak in the biomass accumulation rate in the blue line and the peak in the phytoplankton division rate in the red line. And that lag is of about three months, which is the same that we saw in the satellite record. However, there are more insights that we can take from this time series. For example, at the beginning of winter, there is an inflection point where the decline in, in biomass, in surface ocean phytoplankton biomass, starts slowing down, even though phytoplankton division rates are still declining. So let's try to understand this a little bit more. We're following the blue line in the fall, and the blue line is in the negative. That means that we are losing phytoplankton biomass. There is a decline in the phytoplankton biomass. And then as we go into the beginning of winter, the blue line starts going up. It is still in the negative, which means we're still losing biomass, but it's going up. That means that we're losing biomass at a slower pace, even though we're still going into further lower values of phytoplankton growth, further lower values of phytoplankton division rates. So the way we understand this is that during this winter time, we have a deepening of the surface ocean mix layer, which is driving a dilution of the planktonic community reducing the encounter rate between phytoplankton and zooplankton and reducing the grazing pressure of zooplankton on phytoplankton. Then, as we go into the summer, the upper ocean re-stratifies and recouples the encounter rate of phytoplankton and zooplankton, increasing again the grazing pressure of zooplankton on phytoplankton. And that is the only way that we can explain that at the moment where we have the highest phytoplankton growth, the highest phytoplankton division rates, that's about the time where we see again a shift and phytoplankton biomass stops accumulating and it starts declining. And then we go again into the deepening of the mixed layer and the dilution phase. So this is what is called the dilution recoupling hypothesis. And what we have done here is confirm using in situ float observations, some of the ideas that Mike Vernfeld has been developing using the satellite record. Where the main takeaway is that Changes in bottom-up processes are not enough to understand the seasonality in phytoplankton bloom dynamics, and we need to also understand changes in loss processes and grazing processes to better understand things like bloom initiation, bloom termination, and probably also to project future changes in phytoplankton bloom dynamics. Now, what I showed you before was using all the floats in the SOCOM array. However, most of the floats are located, or let's say it this way, the highest density of float profiles comes from the subantarctic zone and the polar Antarctic zone. So in a way, the signal that I just showed you is biased towards the subantarctic zone and the polar Antarctic zone. Here, I'm showing you what happens at the two extremes. On the left, I'm showing you in red, all the flows that I use, which are the ones in the subtropical zone. So that's, those are the flows that are more towards the north, more towards the equator. And here we basically see a full decoupling between the phytoplankton division rate in red and the phytoplankton accumulation rate in bloom, where the bloom actually occurs when we have the lowest phytoplankton division rates, which is supposed to be during the winter season. However, here we are in the subtropics. So low phytoplankton division rates are not that low but we still have during the winter, the deepening of the mixed layer, driving the dilution of the planktonic community and the decreasing in the grazing pressure on phytoplankton. And that's why we think we observe the blooming time happening during the moment where we have the lowest phytoplankton rate, phytoplankton division rate. So it's a fully um, or highly top-down driven uh, seasonality in the bloom. On the right, I'm showing you the other stream. I'm showing you the floats that during some part of the year were capturing information below the ice. And that is shown here by this shaded blue timing or, or panel. And the main takeaway is that we observe that the phytoflanton blooms starts even though uh, during the moment where this, the surface ocean is still covered by ice. 
So at the middle of the winter, when we have per se very low light conditions and having the ice there only further increases the light limitation during at this part of the ocean, those conditions are harsh, but are not harsh enough to prevent the start of the bloom. So we're basically able to see that phytoplankton bloom starts in the Antarctica sun, in the Antarctic sun, or the seasonal ice sun, well before the ice starts to retreat. Okay, for the second study that I want to talk about, as I said before, was more directly aimed at estimating vertically resolved estimates of primary production. So here in the middle panel, I'm showing you the vertically resolved estimates, the zonal mean obtained from the float information applied to the Argo CBPM. On the left, I'm showing you zonal mean estimates from in C2 C14 based observations of primary production. And in general, you can see there is a good agreement between the collection of observations on the left and the float model based primary production estimates in the middle panel, where primary production tends to be a little bit higher in the high latitudes, somewhat lower in the subtropics. And the vertical layer where we have the highest productivity is constrained to about 50 meters in the water column, both in the observations and in the float-based estimates. On the right, we have the difference between the observations and the floats. We can see the full range is between minus 18 and plus 18 milligrams of carbon per cubic meter per day, but most of the difference are constrained between minus six and six milligrams of carbon per cubic meter per day. And that is about 20% of the maximum seasonal difference in vertically resolved primary production at high latitudes. Now, now that we have this vertically resolved information of marine primary production, I wanted to see what kind of new insights we can gain from this. In the bottom panel on the left, I'm showing you the nitrate concentration, the vertically resolved nitrate concentration as measured by the floats. And you can see there's not much of a matching or correlation between the concentration of nitrate and that of vertically resolved primary production coming from the floats. In the middle panel, I'm showing you the vertically cumulative net primary production. That is, if we start integrating primary production from the surface of the ocean towards depth, how much of that primary production has occurred at any given depth? So the scale of this panel varies between zero and 100%. On the right, I'm showing you the vertical gradient in the nitrate concentration as measured by the floats, where positive values indicate that the nitrate concentration at depth is higher than the nitrate concentration at the surface. So in a way, the appearance of the very strong red colors is showing you the places where we have the highest nitrate gradient, which is um, an indirect estimation of the nitrocline. In the black line, the black line is taken from the panel in the middle, and that is the place where 90% of vertically integrated net primary production has occurred. And you can see that there is a good agreement between the meridional displacement in the depth where 90% of the vertical integrated primary production has occurred and that of the infer nitrocline. And that is actually a very interesting result because it's an emergent result. The CBPM doesn't use any information on nutrients to parameterize phytoplankton division rates. So the fact that the gradient in the nitrogen concentration as observed by the float agrees well with changes in the bottom layer of the, of the vertical integrated primary production suggests that the use of the chlorophyll to carbon ratio to parameterize phytoplankton division rates in primary production is probably giving us a coherent picture of primary productivity in the global ocean. Here, I'm showing you more results uh, on these uh, vertically resolved estimates of primary production. The upper two panels, I'm showing you estimates of primary production for the Southern Ocean. The red dots are in situ observations taken from this compilation from, compilation from Mara et al. Each of the blue lines are 
profiles of primary production taken from the floats, and the black line is the average of the blue lines. So the average of all the vertically resolved primary production estimates coming from the floats. And you can see in some places there is quite a mismatch in surface ocean production. So for example, in this upper panel, surface observations are much higher than the floats. In the second panel, the float observations of surface primary production are much higher than the observations. But overall, at different regions of the ocean, going from the Southern Ocean to the higher northern latitudes to the Pacific Central Ocean, the model is able to capture the vertical difference in the structure of primary productivity, even these deep productivity maximums that we observe in the subtropical Pacific Ocean. On the right, I'm showing you some of the misfits between each of the observations, so each of the red dots, and the mean of all the flow profiles, the black line. And even though at some points we can get very large observations or very large misfits, the average misfit is minus 15.8 milligrams of carbon per cubic meter per day. In terms of relative misfits, again, when we go to the individual misfits, we can get very, very large misfits that go up to 1,000%. But the average of all the misfits is quite reasonable, is plus 8.3%. So I believe that these misfits are quite reasonable and they are, of course, within the range that allow us to capture seasonal difference in vertically resolved primary production. And also we need to keep in mind that these are not per measurement and model estimates. So we shouldn't expect a perfect agreement between the observations and the model NPP estimates coming from the floats. Right now, with the early steps of these primary production estimates coming from the floats, what we're trying to do is to capture some of the large spatial patterns in primary productivity and the seasonal difference in primary production in the global ocean. So here are some of the conclusions from these two papers. The first one was looking at Southern Ocean blooms, where we saw that the seasonal decoupling between the phytoplankton division rate and the accumulation rate is confirmed using the float observation as we previously saw in the satellite record. Blooming events can occur during periods of declining division rates and bloom decline can occur during periods of high division rates. And this highlights the importance of understanding loss processes in dictating the evolution of the seasonal cycle in biomass. And we also saw that under ice observations show that biomass starts increasing early in winter, well before the sea ice begins to retreat. Some of the conclusions related to the float-based net primary production estimates is that seasonal float-based NPP agrees well with large scale patterns inferred from dead resolved observations, particularly as we saw the sonal means in vertically resolved primary production. Differences between the debt resolved float base and observed NPP are mostly within 20%, which is uh, are mostly within 20% of the maximum range in the seasonal variability. So that was those six milligrams of carbon per cubic meter per day that we saw again in the vertically resolved um, sonal means of productivity. And then the vertical extending water column productivity agrees well with the meridional changes in intercline depth, which is an emergent property of the productivity model which is not informed by information on nutrients. So that means that changes in the chlorophyll to carbon ratio seems to actually predict quite well nutrient limitation, even in the Southern Ocean. And that is interesting because we all know we have iron limiting effects there and they, they play their unique roles on phytoplankton physiology. However, there seems to be uh, enough information in changes in the chlorophyll to carbon ratio that we still can get reasonable um, estimates of vertically resolved productivity using the flow data. And um, if you have doubts about that, I have validated some of the phytoplankton division rates in the Southern Ocean in the first paper that is published uh, on the blooms. And you're welcome to look at that to see how well uh, the model does on that. And here I'm showing you some of the main reference that I have used during this talk. Um, I hope this has been useful for everyone, feel, feel, feel free to contact me with any questions or to ask me during the uh, live presentation in the workshop. Thank you very much.